Clemson defensive tackle Brian Brzee is the exact reason why box score scouting doesn't work. We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much as always. We get Locked on Saints, your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert credential member of the media, media credential member of the media, nailed it. Your senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the New Orleans Saints. You can find me Tuesdays on Locked on NFL and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, it's Thursday, so we're going through our draft prospect spotlights. And today is Clemson defensive tackle Brian Brzee. Been getting a lot of requests for this one, and this is such a remarkable story of a human being and perseverance when you talk about Brian Brzee. So today, what we're going to go through is, of course, how he fits, potentially contributes, if he's a selection for the Saints in the first round or potentially even in the second round. Let's just say if he's a Saints selection. We'll also take a look at why context matters when it comes to player evaluation. There's a lot of life stuff around Brian Brzee that maybe informs a little bit about the stat sheet. And that's where we're going to start today because a Brian Brzee pick for the New Orleans Saints, especially in the first round, would not be about stats. It would not necessarily be about production, things like that. I mean, we're talking about a guy who is a first round, expected to be a first round drafted player that on many boards, including like Dane Brugler's and others, is the second best defensive tackle in this year's class. In fact, he's the only other defensive tackle with a pure round one grade on Dane Brugler's um, uh, uh, position rankings outside of Jalen Carter. Guys like Kalaja Kansi and Mozzie Smith are one First to second round, Brian Brzee is the only other kind of pure first round guy. But when you look at the stats and you just look at the box score, you kind of scratch your head and wonder why. Uh, In in total throughout his career, 50 tackles, 15 of those for a loss, and then just nine sacks, 11 uh, 11 fumbles forced, has uh, an interception as well as five passes defensed on his uh, ledger, which is really nice. But in terms of what you're looking for from a defensive tackle, there are numbers out there like, let's say, Jalen Carter with 18 and a half tackles for a loss as opposed to just 15 and 83 tackles as opposed to 50. You look at um, guys like Kalaja Kanti, who have 34 and a half tackles for a loss and 16 sacks as compared to um, Brian Brzee at 15 tackles for a loss and nine sacks are so nearly doubling, well, more than doubling on tackles for a loss, nearly doubling when it comes to sacks. So why do we look at Brian Brzee as a pure first rounder? And I think all of that has to do with understanding the context around him. We'll talk about, we'll get to the context around sort of his stats and his production and things like that here in a little bit. But what is it about him that makes him special? And I think there are a couple of different things that I want to highlight around Brian Brzee that I think make him special. And a big part of it is just looking at the athleticism. He is a burly and athletic Dude comes in at six foot five, two hundred ninety eight pounds. Would be easy to get him up to three hundred. Uh, obviously, you're only a couple pounds away there. Four point eight six forty yard dash. Great splits at both ten and twenty there. Great shuttle time in terms at at his position four three eight. Great three cone time seven four one at his size. You love seeing three cones sub seven seconds, but for defensive tackles that doesn't always happen. Um, You would like to see a little bit more upper body strength from him, just 22 bench reps, but that's not necessarily translating upper body strength into uh, play, right? Into on-field play, that's I can lift things up and put them down. That's that's kind of what you got there. Um, pretty pretty okay arm length, 32 and a half inches, uh, but great hand size at, 10, at, at just over 10 inches. So the body type is absolutely there. The athleticism is absolutely there. And I think one of the things that I like so much about Brian Brzee is that the mentality is absolutely there. The coaches, as well as the players, everyone in the Clemson program absolutely loved him. So you got a lot of plus character traits there. 
He's got a lot of versatility playing all the way from nose tackle out to just inside the, the, the offensive tackle. So if you look at him as sort of a zero tech all the way out to three tech, all the way out to five tech, potentially five tech, just meaning that you're lining up if you're a defensive end you're lining up on the inside shoulder of the tackle effectively. It's a a run stopper position, basically. But run stopping is probably the place that you want to see Brian Brzee improve a little bit. But he does a great job in terms of the mental capacity that he has to have for this game. You'll see him get tied up in blocks, but he's able to get out of those blocks. And the entire time that he's engaged in a block, his eyes are not on the offensive lineman that's blocking him. His eyes are in the backfield watching the ball carrier, watching the quarterback so that he understands where to shed, which direction to go, which way to flow. Really good in terms of his discipline with run fits or his his responsibilities in the run game. If a play goes one way, which gap is he attacking? If a play goes another way, which gap is he attacking? That can become a little bit tough to manage when you're going up against what are called flow blocks, where you have offensive linemen instead of blocking a specific player, the one right in front of them, they're flowing to certain gaps on the defense. So that means that it's effectively moving gaps. So how do you maintain your discipline there? He does a really, really good job of that. I think that you also look at him as somebody that, along with that positional versatility, can manage double teams. He's not necessarily the best when it comes to counter moves. I think that's probably a place that you want to see him improve. You want to see him improve in terms of leverage as well. But he is a really, really, really hard hand fighter. Um, he's got he's got the moves that you need at that level to be able to translate up to the NFL. He's got sort of the repertoire that he needs to have to be effective at the next level. It's just leverage and counter moves are kind of the next thing that you want to develop. But you can say that about Jalen Carter. You can say that about Mozzie Smith. You could say that about Kalaja Kansi. There are always going to be one or two things that every single one of these prospects is going to need to work with. There's no such thing as a perfect prospect that goes from college over to uh, the NFL. He's got really, really good anchor strength as well. So think about that as like you drop an anchor from a boat to make sure that the boat doesn't go anywhere, right? So his anchor, his lower body, very strong, which keeps him from getting moved off of the spots that he's trying to attack, the spot that he's trying to man up, the spot that he is effectively holding, all of those things as well. So his ability to be able to just plant and disrupt (laughs) is really, really good. And a lot of fun to watch. And I think that that's one of the things that you look at here. Then when you look at the stat sheet, four sacks, oh, excuse me, yeah, four sacks back in 2020, one and a half in 2021 and just four games played, three and a half in 2022. Those numbers don't jump off the page for you, even as an interior defensive lineman, where we usually give a little bit more grace in terms of sack production. So I understand somebody looking at the stat sheet and simply saying, ah, Maybe this isn't a good fit, but that's not what tells the full story of Brian Brzee. This was a guy who was the ACC Defensive Rookie of the Year. He was the number one defensive tackle coming out of high school across the nation. And on top of that, he was the number one college recruit or high school recruit, excuse me, coming out that year in his class. He was one spot ahead of Alabama quarterback Bryce Young, who very well might be the number one selection this year. So you see that there's a bed of potential that's there. You want to talk about a low or excuse me, a high floor prospect. That's where Brian Brzee comes in. The big thing is, can he stay healthy? ACL tear back in 2021, had shoulder surgery back in 2022, dealt with a kidney infection in 2022 as well, which much like the lacerated kidney that Marshawn Lattimore suffered that caused him to miss 11 games for the New Orleans Saints last year, can't really hold that against them. Sometimes your body just goes it, it just it just goes rogue on you. Completely get all that. So I'm not going to hold a kidney infection against the guy, but you are a little bit under. It, it is understandable to be a little bit cautious around that ACL tear just a couple of years ago, and then the shoulder surgery about a year ago or a little bit over a year ago. And so that's all stuff worth watching. But man, when it comes to the raw tools, the athleticism, the size, everything that you need to be a football player. Brian Brzee checks all of those boxes, even if the boxes on the stat uh, stat sheet aren't necessarily full up just yet. Doesn't mean that he won't fill them up at the next level. Context matters when it comes to player evaluation. So we have to go beyond the box score, beyond the athletic testing. Let's discuss a little bit of Brian Brzee's story and help you fall in love with the guy that is the absolute definition of perseverance. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. 
And today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by the best tasting protein bar on the market, Built Bar. There's something exciting coming to Built.com on April 22nd. So this weekend, I don't know all the details just yet, but the excitement is real and it's something that you won't want to miss. I know that you know how Built Bar works. They have these incredible protein bars in all different types of flavors, the best across the entire world. And these flavor drops that they do always come in these unreal flavors and sometimes in a limited quantity. So make sure you're checking out the website on April 22nd. I'm hoping for something maybe coffee flavored, like a caramel coffee something or another, or I, I don't know, that's that's my favorite kind of stuff. So I, that's that's kind of what I'm hoping for right now. So go ahead and mark your calendars. Head over to Built.com on Saturday, April 22nd to see and potentially be one of the first people to discover what the hype is all about. I can't wait to see what the new flavor is myself. Make sure you use that promo code Locked On 15 all one word, all caps. Make sure you use the digits too, 15LOCKEDON15. And you're going to get 15% off of your order over at Built.com. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks, as always, making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget tomorrow's episode, in case you missed it, getting you all caught up with all the Saints news from around uh, this this past week. And then, of course, also Frenzy Friday to get another mock draft in as well. So we got all of that coming up for you in tomorrow's episode. Today, it's our draft prospect spotlight day. So we're looking at Clemson defensive tackle Brian Brzee. And as we just laid out, the stat sheet isn't impressive when it comes to Brian Brzee. It's not disappointing, but the it, let's say it's underwhelming, right? It's not what you expect for a guy that's being touted as a pure first rounder. And so when we look at where Brian Brzee is at the moment, um, we have to understand that it's not just about the box score. It's not just about the stat sheet, that we have to understand that context is important when it comes to these player evaluations as well. And this is a player evaluation that has a lot of context to be taken into consideration. We discussed the injuries a moment ago, uh, ACL injury in 2021 or ACL surgery eventually in 2021, which had him play only four games uh, after a, a season in which he was, you know, ACC defensive rookie of the year. He was, you know, a guy that was coming into college as the number one recruit in the country. He also was freshman All-American, first team All-ACC. He blocked a field goal and just did so much back in 2020. 2021, even, just, even though he missed those nine games with that ACL injury, he was still third team All-ACC. And then he came back in 2022, second team All-ACC, missed four games. And I believe that those games were tied to both the shoulder as well as the kidney infection that we had mentioned earlier. So when we look at where Brian Brzee is and who Brian Brzee is, his story can't be told without an understanding of his perseverance and his ability to fight through unimaginable adversity. I'm going to get a little kind of Debbie Downer here for a moment. And I'm going to tell you a story. Um, in September of 2022, so at the beginning of the 2022 collegiate football season for Brzee, his sister, Ella, 15 years old, passed away due to an aggressive form of brain cancer. And it was an 18th month fight before that. So when you look at sort of, if you take into consideration what 18 months before that moment was, diagnosis, fight for his little sister, Ella, him being a big brother, him watching all of that happen, while also recovering from an ACL injury, ACL surgery, all of that. Then he gets back onto the football field. The season gets ready to go. Who knows where the understanding of where Ella was at that point in terms of her fight, her recovery, her battle. And then all of a sudden, this happened and she passes away. And now he goes out there and has to play, or not has to play, but he goes out there and, and, and plays 10 games that season with that in the back of his head the entire year. That's not easy, y'all. Like that is unimaginable adversity that someone battles through. And I'm sure for him, if you ask him, like for him, I'm sure it's something like for 10 games he went out there or however many games after that, he went out there and he played for her. And while I appreciate and understand that, I also understand and appreciate, I understand and appreciate the beauty of that. I also understand and appreciate very much the complexity of that. And then to deal with kidney infection, shoulder surgery, things like that on top of it, this is a guy that just went through so much adversity. 
He missed those last four games, was still second team all ACC, three and a half sacks, five and a half tackles for a loss, 15 tackles in 2022 with two passes defense. So he's had a pretty impressive season considering everything that he went through and considering that he missed, let's say, oh, he missed four games, right? So if you were to take that, what is that, three and a half sacks over the course of over the course of 10 games, and then you add in another four games of that, you might say that he could have had five sacks by the end of that season, right? And so I, I just want to make sure that like when we, when we discuss some of these prospects and we talk about, oh yeah, well, the numbers were a little underwhelming and didn't really fill up the box score and all these other things. So we understand that sometimes there's, there's really, really important context to that. And it's not just, oh, this player was bad for a year or all of a sudden this player forgot how to play football. That's not the case when it comes to Brian Brzee. In fact, the case for Brian Brzee is that he played football in one of the most challenging personal environments anyone would ever could possibly experience. And we've seen this over and over again. We've seen it at the NFL level. We've seen it, you know, everywhere. It's where people are playing around and for and, you know, after deaths around them and things like that. But that is never an easy thing. That is never easy to just kind of go, ah, okay, well, he, he chose to be back out of the football field, so clearly he's okay. No, that's not the way that the mentals work ever, not just in the game of football, but in life. I mean, goodness. And so I, I wanted to highlight this, not because I want to like bang the drum of like, this happened to Brian Brzee, but I do want to bang the drum of, shout out to you, Brian, for playing through what you played through and still putting yourself in position to be a first round pick in the 2023 NFL draft. And of course, nothing but love and positivity to his family based on what they've had to deal with since September of 2022. Because I can promise you, I can promise you, that they're still dealing with it. It's not over for them. So you look at all of the things that you love about players that come out and play your favorite game, football, and they play for your favorite team. What do you love? You love guys that can make plays on the field. You love guys that are, you know, body beautiful, that do the thing that, you know, that look the part of a football player that can go out there and fight through adversity and can always show up and arrive for your favorite team. Brian Brzee is the guy that will always show up and arrive for your favorite team. That's why he was, quote, beloved at Clemson. That's part of why. He's also extremely teachable. He loves to teach. He does all of it. He does all of it. And so I'm still very much a believer in Mozzie Smith in the first round. And there's a large part of me that is Mozzie Smith, no matter what straight up Vontae Mack stuff. But, but when it comes to Brian Brzee, if he's drafted at 29 in the first round, A, I would not be surprised. And B, I would be far from disappointed. And C, I would consider that far from underwhelming for the New Orleans Saints who need that kind of character and want that kind of character in their locker room and want that type of tenacity on their defensive line. Coming up next, you put that tenacity on the defensive line, but how does he fit? Where does he contribute? We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it. Who that nation rabbit of today's episode of Locked on Saints. And we are capping off our Brian Brzee draft prospect spotlight. We discussed his ability to manage adversity to arrive. We looked over his, uh, you know, his strengths, some of the things that he needs to continue to work on, stuff like that. And so now what we want to look at is how does he fit for the New Orleans Saints? The thing about Brian Brzee that I think is exciting is that he is a very talented pass rusher. He's really a um, disruptive penetrator, three tech, lining up between the guard and tackle, pinning his ears back and just rushing up the middle and, and, and disrupting the opposing quarterback, which we know in the interior, that is the quickest and easiest way, or not easiest, not definitely not the easiest, so sorry, but it is the quickest way to disrupt a quarterback when you win off of the offensive line there. And so that's going to be a big piece of what you would look at in terms of Brian Brzee and who he, who he is at the next level. He is a pass rushing disruptor for you. Really violent hands, really heavy hands as well. You can see when you watch the, when you watch the tape, and I don't just mean you have to have like collegiate all 22 or anything like that, like go and just pick a Clemson game on YouTube and watch it real quick because you can see 
Brian Brzee, right? He's on the defensive line. So he's in the, he's in the broadcast shot. So you can see him every single snap. And you're watching, but what you're really watching is not Brian Brzee. You're watching the offensive linemen on the other side that go, whoa, and just kind of like back up and, 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 and kind of, you know, take a, it's like they just took a shot. And then so they just get thrown off guard by how heavy and violent his hands are. And that is something that you love to see. I mean, you love to see that from a guy who's six foot five, 300 pounds playing like he's six foot five, 300 pounds. That's a great thing. And so you, you know what you can get from him is an effective pass rusher and an effective disruptor. The thing you want to see him develop more into is a little bit more of a run stopper. And that's going to take some time. He's got to get better at understanding leverage. He's got to rebuild sort of some of his counters, things like that. Todd Grantham, the Saints defensive line coach, is a defensive line specialist and loves an attacking defensive line. He'll be able to help with some of those things. But the big thing that you're looking at when it comes to, or one of the big things that you're looking at, I keep saying that, saying that, I'm sorry. It's my, it's my recycled phrase of the day, apparently. But when you think about where Brian Brzee fits in for the Saints, you're thinking about him as a, let's call it a, a rush specialist, maybe a two down player, a second and long, third and long kind of guy. Maybe you don't necessarily have him out there on first downs. You keep your rotation going to where you've got guys like Colin Saunders and Malcolm Roach that you can trust on rushing downs. You've got Nathan Shepard who you can trust on rushing downs. And then maybe you just cycle Brian Brzee in when it makes the most sense, third and long type situations, things like that, obvious passing downs and let him just play from there. What you're not going to do is take Brian Brzee week one and stick him at one tech or, or nose tackle and say, okay, go out there and clog up the middle. Now he can take on some double teams and he can occupy some double teams. He does a good job at all of that. But what you're not going to see him do is be massively impactful in the run game up the middle right away. That's going to take a little bit of time to develop. So his terms of his fit and contribution in 2023 for the New Orleans Saints, it's that of a pass rush specialist in the interior, which name one on the New Orleans Saints defensive line right now. Do they have an interior pass rush specialist? I don't think that it's fair to say that they do at this time. Nathan Shepard had a top 10 uh, pass rush win rate in 2022 with the New York Jets, but how does he translate to the rush plan? How does he translate to the system of the New Orleans Saints? Now, clearly the Saints feel really good about Nathan Shepard because not only did they go out and sign him this year, they went out and tried to sign him last offseason as well. So they know what they want to do with Nathan Shepard. But when you look at Brian Brzee, what he brings you is a clear pass rush specialist on the defensive line, particularly in the interior. You know Cam Jordan's always going to be your pass rush specialist, but he's rushing from the edge. Who's the guy that can be disruptive when it counts in the middle? Brian Brzee can become or can be that guy almost immediately. Almost immediately. And then the other pieces in terms of him developing into a three-down defensive lineman, you're watching that happen over the course of his first year or over the course of his first couple of years. And that's not a bad thing because he still has an immediate impact in 2023 in the place that matters, dare I say, the most, which is by being that disruptive pass rusher right up the middle and straight up in the grill in face of the opposing quarterback. Listen, if the Saints are 20th in run y rushing yards allowed next year, but they are second again in terms of passing yards, then they're a winning team in 2023. Like they have a winning record. I don't believe that you have to look at this New Orleans Saints team who ranked 24th in rushing yards allowed in 2022 and say, whoa, 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 the Saints defense can't be good unless they're top five in the run game again. Yes, they had been top five in the run game for the previous few years. That was a lot of fun to watch. It forced teams to have to be one dimensional. You love that. But the run game consistently does not translate being a defense that gives up run rushing yards consistently does not translate to being a defense that gives up points. Being a defense that can't stop the passing game, however, always translates to being a team that consistently gives up points. If you rank low as a pass defense, you rank low as an overall scoring defense. If you rank low as a rush yards defense, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to rank low as a scoring defense. So for me, get yourself the player that's going to be able to come in and immediately impact the passing game and give them time to grow into a better run stopper. That's fine. Finish top 20 in rushing yards, but finish top five in passing yards allowed 
so that you can keep the points off the board. That's how points are scored in today's NFL. That'll change. That'll change. We'll go back to the run game. We're seeing it over the course of the past couple of years, of course, but I think you got another couple of years before that. Right now, you still want to stop the passing game. And as contracts get bigger, salary cap gets bigger, teams get more expensive, all of those things, players get more expensive, it's only going to start leaning more and more and more towards the big highlights, the passing game. So when you look at Brian Brzee, he's somebody that comes in with a necessary sort of raise of development that you're wanting to see. But where he's already ready to make an immediate impact is the most important place where the Saints need impact in 2023. Coming up in tomorrow's episode, it's In Case You Missed It. We'll get you caught up on all top 30 visits that the New Orleans Saints had over the course of the top 30 uh, period for the offseason, which is now wrapped up. So we'll take a look at every single one of them. I'll give you some notes on every single one of those players as well. We'll probably do that for a couple of segments tomorrow. Make sure you know all about those prospects and you know those names, including a guy that has really flown under the radar, uh, fighting a lion eye safety, Jartavius Quan Martin. We'll tell you a little bit about him tomorrow and why you should know that name. And we'll also take a look at Frenzy Friday. So we'll have a little fun with a, uh, a wacky mock draft as well. So I appreciate y'all as always for Making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day for making a show a part of your day, a part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. And as always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.